If you would, take your Bible. I have Isaiah 29 up there. And I want you to turn in that direction. But um, I have it in my notes later, and I'm going to jumble it around just a little bit. So when you get to Isaiah 29, just look back a little bit. We're going to be in Isaiah 28. <clears throat> Boy, I tell you what, these leaves are out there are pretty, but they're sure clogging up our throats and our sinuses, aren't they? Well, I tell you what, I mean, I got a bunch of stuff in here and I'm pretty sure it's just allergy is what it is. When I, I keep thinking about that picture, and Bible verses keep jumping in my head. Paul, the Apostle Paul said, in all things, give God the praise. Paul also said, I've learned having food and raiment therewith to be content. Uh, we passed by a place here up on 55 uh, Friday, uh, and they store RVs up here. And it took them a little while to build that place up there. And no sooner than they built it, opened it up, they had already filled that lot with RVs and campers, things like that. And now they've got the land south of it, and they're building more of those places. There are storage units going up everywhere, all over the land. There's even an app now, I saw something the other day on <clears throat> TV show I was watching or something like that, but it was an app that if you've got empty basement, empty garage, empty bedroom, an empty barn, anything like that, and you want to rent it out so people can store their stuff in it, you use that app and show the space and how much you've got of it for rent. And then I guess people in your area can come and throw their old nasty stuff into your house or whatever. I saw, I was looking at Cheryl's face. Cheryl was going, yes, bring those 12 boxes of cockroaches in, please. Set them right there by the kitchen sink, if you would. You know what that tells me? We got too much junk in this country. And we're fixing to buy more for Christmas. We are. In fact, it's already started. We're fixing to buy more junk that we don't need, put it in places that we don't have. And um, I mean, I, I'm a capitalist, true and true. But even capitalism has its abuses. And I think we're living in those days right now. Anyway, uh, Isaiah 28. I want you to look at verse 1. It says, Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim. The drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower. Caleb used to work at a wedding venue up here in just off 55 there north of uh, Peevely. And it was one of those uh, wineries or something like that. He'd come home, big pocket full of money on weekends because he said the drunker they get, the bigger they tip. And he's seen weddings where the bride and the groom and all the bridesmaids and all the groomsmen and those expensive suits and those real pretty expensive dresses. By the time one o'clock rolls around, they're all puking drunk. Caleb said he's had, in one case, the bride coming over to him crying on him, saying, oh, I just love you so much. And it just used to sicken me to hear him tell these stories about how drunk people got at their wedding. He's actually seen people so angry that the wedding venue had to shut down the bar 
And literally, guys would be pulling thousand dollars, three thousand dollars out of their wallet so that somebody would go and buy more alcohol for the party. And now we're adding marijuana to the drunkenness is what we're doing. I knew that when they legalized medical marijuana and they got enough people hooked up on that, that it would no longer be medical marijuana. It would be everybody's marijuana. And uh, if you are not registered to vote, register. And then you show up in November and you vote down that Amendment 3 that will legalize, uh, what do they call it? Recreational marijuana use, you vote that stupid thing down and send word to Jefferson City, we don't do that in Missouri. Can I hear God's people say amen? Listen, it's, we got to start taking a stand on this stuff. This is killing our nation. Anybody that says that marijuana is not a... Um, boy, I can't even think of my words today. Huh? A gateway drug is crazy. You start getting people... Roy, wouldn't have, Roy would not be a drunk had he not ever taken his first drink. He wouldn't be. He wouldn't have had the problems that he had in life. He wouldn't have the health problems that he's got now. He wouldn't have had the sorrow that he's carried now for the last 30 some odd years. He would have had none of that had he not ever taken his first drink. And then you try to tell me that people can sit all day long and get high on marijuana and at the end of the day, they're satisfied. Let me tell you something. The human body is never satisfied with anything that it likes. Never. We are, we are exactly what Mick Jagger sang back in the 60s. I can't get no satisfaction. What is that guy like? 98 years old now? They wheel him out on the stage and he put a guitar in his hand. He's still singing it. He's an old, crazy old man now, still looking for satisfaction. He hadn't found it yet. I have. I have. I found Jesus. I found salvation. I found the Word of God. I'm, I'm happy. I'm satisfied. I ain't going nowhere else. Amen. Woe to the crown of pride to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. I want you to look at verse 7. But they also, I want you to notice the wording, the phrasing that the Bible uses here. They have erred through wine. Does wine cause you to make errors? Think about it now. Now, I want you to think on this on two levels. The physical level... But I want to concentrate on the spiritual level of it. There is, and you're fixing to see it in a minute. There is a physical drunkenness. And there is something far worse than that. A spiritual drunkenness. And I'm telling you, it's far worse and far more dangerous. Because you can take an old gutter drunk like Roy. Love you, buddy. He told me I could use all these colorful, yeah. You take somebody like him, and he, he knows he wants to quit, can't do it by himself, and it takes God stepping in his life, helping him out, helping him stay sober. I don't know how in the world he stays sober 33 years, but God helped him do it. One day at a time. And uh, God has helped him all along the way. And when you're a physical drunk, you can still cry out to Jesus and God will save you and God will deliver you from that junk. 
Somebody say amen. But a spiritual drunk? And I'll show it to you in a minute. They have erred through wine. And through strong drink are out of... What's that phrase? The way. Everybody say, the way. The way. Is there a place in the Bible that sounds familiar to you? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So that a spiritual drunk is out of the way. They don't know who Jesus is. They do not know the way to God. Through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet. The church leaders. Have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They're, you know what that, you know what that phrase tells me? Swallowed up of wine. So here's Roy and he's got him a, Mogan David. Is that one of them? Okay. Rubbing. I've known guys that drink aftershave. Yep. And they swallow up their wine, right? But then quickly the wine swallows up them. See what I'm saying? Yeah, who's in control now? You or the wine? They're swallowed up of wine. They're out of the way through strong drink. They err. There it is again. They err in vision. That means they cannot see straight. They cannot read the Bible right. They can, they can make no proper interpretation of scriptures. And they cannot drive a car. Okay? That's the physical level and the spiritual level. Uh, they're out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. And then verse 8, for all tables. What is, what is this we have right here? Communion what? Table. It represents, this is not our salvation. We don't eat what's on this table, especially this plastic stuff here. We don't eat what's on this table and then get saved by it. It, but it represents our communion and fellowship in the suffering of Jesus Christ who was broken for our salvation. But imagine now, we come here on communion night and John comes down here and before we hand out the communion wafers, John comes over here, and vomits all over the top of it, and then starts handing it out to everybody. Any takers? Poor John. And yet, we have preachers all over America, in fact, all over the world, that are serving up vomit. And the dogs in the church sure love lapping it up, don't they? All tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean. Now, Isaiah 29. You're going to see this on the spiritual level. Verse 9. Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken. Watch this now. They are drunken. But not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. So how did they get, how did they get high? How did they get drunk? How did they get buzzed out of their mind? Well, he says it in the very next verse. Verse 10, for the Lord hath poured out upon you the Spirit, watch this now, see that word Spirit? Underline that, that's your word. There is, imagine all the devils that are around us every day, you know, arrow tail and a pitchfork and red horns and a red jumpsuit, right? 
Is that what they look like? And they make deviled ham with deviled eggs and devil's food cake. So imagine devils all around you, but one group in particular is a spirit of slumber, a spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes. So here's what we can do. We can, we can look at this and say, God, please help these people, and God... Show me what I can do to feed this little girl. Show me what I can do to help these people out. Or, you can close your eyes to it and say, it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist, it's make-believe. I don't want to look at that anymore, it makes me uncomfortable, I want to move on. You can do that. It's up to you. The Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep. And have closed your eyes. When your eyes are closed, you cannot see the Bible. You cannot see the doctrines of the Bible. You cannot see the types and the shadows of the Bible. You cannot see the prophets of the Bible, the prophecies of the Bible. You cannot see any of those things. And when that happens, it causes us who are looking for some fulfillment in life, it causes us then to look in other places for that fulfillment. And so we try, we, we dig into other religions. Starts out with going maybe to other churches. Or we, we, um, we dig around on the internet and we're looking at spiritual things on the internet and we find people who refer to themselves as, well, I'm not a religious person, I'm a spiritual person. You know what that means? That just means they're full of spirits. They're full of devils is what they are. If they cannot identify you, the things that they stand for and the things they believe, that tells you that they're hiding something from you. And they cannot see the truth for what it really is. They have closed their eyes or a spirit has blinded them. Paul talked about the devil. The God of this world hath blinded the minds of men so that they cannot see their sins. They cannot see the truth. They cannot see the reality of God's judgment, God's pending wrath being poured out upon them. They cannot see that. They sit in denial all their life and they attend funerals where preachers stand up and talk about people that they know were no good and how, how great it is that they're in heaven now. And they say to themselves, well, if the preacher said that guy's in heaven, I'm a shoe in. I wasn't, I'm not near as rotten as that guy is. Listen, I've done enough funerals and I've been to enough funerals. I know how people are. You can take the worst person in town and at his funeral, people standing around him going, well, he's in a better place now. No, he's not. He would be better off rotting in prison in Russia or no, North Korea than he would be where he is right now. Somebody say amen. Have closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers hath he covered. That's the preachers of this country who know not the word of God. They will not preach the word of God. They'll not preach the doctrines of the word of God. They will not give you the truth of the gospel. They'll tell you a gospel that makes you feel good about yourself, allows you to keep all of your sins, tells you that God made you the way you are, and we accept you for how you are. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm all for sinners coming into the house of God. But those sinners need to be changed. God changed me. Because I needed it. And the vision of uh, verse 11, the vision of all is becoming to you as the words of a book. Right here. The words of a book that is sealed. Which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. So what he's telling you here is, 
There is a physical, as I explained, there's a physical level drunkenness. This physical world, think about all the things that applies to that. You can't see straight. You can't walk straight. You're out of the way, which is why they, they have... Guys that are drunk cannot walk what? What did Jesus say? That, what kind of road are we on? Straight is the way and narrow is the gate. He did not define Christianity as how, whichever way you want to go is fine with God. No, that's a drunk. And on the spiritual level, you have false prophets, false teachers, false preachers, false Bibles, false brethren, handing out false gospels, delivering false spirits to people so they accept a false Jesus. And when you try to bring them to scriptures, their mind will not accept it, their heart will not accept it, because they have a spirit that keeps their eyes closed. They are in a deep sleep and their eyes are closed and they will never see the gospel for what it is. Father, I ask your blessings now upon this word. Father, show me, Lord, what you would have me to say, how long you'd have me to preach this morning. Lord, do it for your kingdom's sake, do it for these people's sake, do it for my sake, for my family's sake, for all of those that are watching. Father, open our eyes. Help us, dear God, in this life to avoid the drunkenness that is part of this world and the spiritual drunkenness which is far more dangerous and far more deadly to our souls. Show us the way, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, So Pastor Mike, are you saying that you believe that there are devils that are designed specifically to make people uh, act in a way that is that uh, it looks like they're drunk, they act like they're drunk, or... A spirit that blinds people's, literally blinds people's eyes so they can't see. Well, they, I mean, they can see what a Bible is. They can even read the words that are in it or that you can read it to them. But their soul cannot receive it because the spirit that is in them has blinded them to it, has fogged up the word of God and its meaning to them. They cannot understand the, the basics of the doctrines that we believe. Salvation is by grace through faith. Christ died on the cross for all man's sins. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. They cannot understand that and they won't understand it. Because they would, the, the bottom line is, they would rather stay in their drunken state than come out of that and say, I want to live clean. We have several people in our congregation this morning that have battled drugs, battled alcohol, including prescription drugs, battled these things in life, and I promise you, they and I would stand here and tell you, stay away from it, don't get started in that, don't ever go in that direction, because it makes life almost a hell on this earth. And yet there are people out there in this world who will not give up the bottle, will not give up the marijuana. It, it, listen, it will, nothing surprises me anymore. It will not surprise me if they pass that Amendment 3. I know the pot shops are putting enough money out there to get everybody excited about voting on it. And it wouldn't surprise me if that kind of... Listen, that, that stuff is so corrupt. That money is corrupt. That money's tainted. And if I had one of them pot shops call us here looking to dump off $3 million for a tax write-off and spend it on some ministry for Kenya, I'd turn it down. I don't want your money. That's blood money. 
I want nothing to do with it. Matthew chapter 13. Turn there. Matthew 13 is an amazing chapter in the Bible. You ought to read it one day. It is. It's, boy, I mean, it is 58 verses full of truth. Matthew 13, 10. The disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? What is it, one thing about drunks that, well, two things actually, that they have a real problem with? It's speech. Number one, you can't understand a word they say. And number two, they cannot either comprehend the things that you are saying to them. They can't understand it. Even the simplest of things doesn't register in their, bri their brain because of the alcohol or because of the drugs. So Jesus then decides to speak in parables. Little short stories that are just full of doctrine. But he's what they're wondering, why do you speak unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. So what he's saying is, because you have a different spirit in you, a spirit that is not drunk. Amen? You don't believe Rodney Howard Brown, Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, or these other idiots on Trinity Broadcasting Network or any place else that tells you that when the Holy Ghost falls on you, it makes you act like a drunk person. Don't fall for that nonsense. But anyway, he said, I speak unto them in parables because you have a spirit of knowledge in you and wisdom and understanding. And when I speak these parables, you can understand them. But because they have a spirit of slumber on them, a spirit of drunkenness on them, they'll never get it. They'll never understand it. He said in um, verse, verse 11 again, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore, speak I them... Speak I to them, it's, I think he's referring to the Jews here, in parables, because they, seeing, see not. And hearing, they hear not, neither do they, now he's going to tie it together, understand. They see it, and they hear it, but they cannot understand it, they cannot comprehend it. And they will die in their vomit. They will die in their sins. And he said in verse 14, And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. They said, oh, Pastor, that doesn't make sense. Does it want, God want everybody saved? Yes, He does. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But there are people out there who absolutely, under no uncertain terms, do not want anything to do with God, Jesus, the blood of redemption, the blood of sprinkling, salvation by grace through faith. They do not want anything to do with the cross eternal life they don't want anything other than the sins that they have in their life right now they're enjoying those sins and they don't want some preacher telling them how to live and in that case they are drunk and so drunk what happens after you've drank so much you just can't drink no more what happens after that <laughs> You pass out, go to sleep. I miss live PD. When they get a call that there's a car parked in the middle of the street and they roll out there and some guy or some gal is sitting in the car, passed out, drunk. 
with their foot on the brake in the car and drive because they were too drunk and they passed out. Are they just a danger to themselves or are they a danger to others as well? And there's some people, you can take the love of Jesus to them, you can take the gospel to them, you can take the warnings to them. They will not heed them, they do not want them. They would rather keep their beer, their wine, their vodka, their margaritas, their marijuana, their heroin, their fentanyl. You know where practically all the fentanyl that's in the heroin right now is coming from? China. You think that's a mistake? China knows if they can get this country to destroy itself, they won't have to lift a finger. Acts 28, turn there. This is the last words of the Apostle Paul here in the book of Acts. <clears throat> Acts 28, verse 23, And when they had pointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. Can you imagine that? Having church from morning till evening? What would be wrong with that? Not a thing, actually. In fact, generations before us would call us little sissies for getting out after an hour. What, y'all can't take it? And some believed the things which were spoken and some believed not. Now, why couldn't they believe it? Why didn't they believe it? There's a spirit on them. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah, the prophet unto our father, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear. Now, I mean, we're just like application after application of this same verse. Jesus mentioned it. Isaiah mentioned it. Now Paul's using it. Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and, and not perceive. They have eyes, but they can't see. They have ears, but they can't hear. For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. And again, does not God want to heal them? Yes. Do they want to be healed? No. And so God says, if you don't want the healing, if you don't want to be converted, if you don't want to change, then there's nothing we can do for you. It's like the guy, I mentioned him Wednesday night, Bobby. This guy we found passed out up here by our church sign. Pocket full of, he was high then, he had a pocket full of drugs. When he came down, he was going to go back up, Brian. He was going to all the way back up as soon as he come down off that high and he was passed out up here. And so we called the police and they came and arrested him. You know, I got chewed out for that by people on the internet. What'd you call the cops for? Because they saved his life. I figured it was heroin, and I knew that most of those cops carry, um, yeah, Narcan, and it just takes the high right out of them. And they don't feel it no more, and it saves their life. It causes them to breathe again. But over the, over the time that we've known, we haven't seen him in a while, we've tried to help Bobby. Put him up in a hotel a few times. 
helped him out with a little food money. John's witness to him. We've talked to him, gave him Bible, gave him everything we could. But he doesn't want change. Doesn't want to be any different. And if he doesn't want to be changed and he doesn't want to change, you cannot change him. And God knows that. So he gives them ears, but he lets a spirit of slumber close their ears. He gives them eyes, but a spirit of slumber closes their eyes. He gives them a brain and a mind and gives them the ability to understand, but the spirit of sleep and slumber causes them not to understand. If it hadn't been for Lindsay, I guess we would have been dead. Because Lisa and I were so deep asleep the night that our house caught on fire that we didn't smell the smoke and we didn't hear the smoke alarm that was going off. Lindsay comes bolting in our bedroom, didn't even knock. One o'clock in the morning, waking us up. How dare she? Waking us up saying, Dad, the house is on fire. And it wasn't until then that my ears woke up and I heard the smoke alarm going off. And that's something, how the mind works. When you're drunk, high, and out of it, you're not going to see, you're not going to hear, and you're not going to know. Acts chapter 28, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles. Why? Because the Jews are too drunk. The drunkards are of Ephraim. Ephraim is one of the tribes of Israel. That the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. And Paul dwelt two old years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. That's the last, last that we know of Paul and what happened to him in the Bible. We, we know after that that he was uh, executed for being a preacher of the gospel. So back to Isaiah 29, verse 9. Stay yourselves in wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. So all across this land, and let, let me tell you something, I, and uh, the pastor corrected me on this. I had mentioned to you here a, a few weeks ago how there was a church down there in Fort Smith where one of the musicians came out on the stage with his guitar and no shirt on. I, I've since been corrected on that. The pastor told me, he said he, did have, uh, he didn't have a shirt on, he just had one of them vests on. That's just, that just barely does it. When you've got a pastor that allows that kind of worldliness to go on in the house of God and has absolutely no discernment against it whatsoever, you've got a drunk pastor for your pastor. And you've got somebody that allows sodomites to stay together, that allows people who are uh, heterosexual to shack up, live in fornication, when you've got a church that'll put up with that kind of stuff, you got a drunk church. When you will not stand up and take a stand against any immorality and any sin that's plaguing our communities, plaguing our societies, plaguing our schools, when you have people who will not stand for what's right and will not stand for Bible truth, you have a church full of drunks who are so dead and so asleep that they cannot see the reality of what the devil's doing around them. They cannot see the wrath of God that is about to be poured down on them. They cannot see it. In Leviticus chapter 10, verse 9. I want you to think of wine and strong drink now. What time is it? I want you to think of wine and strong drink now as false doctrine or false Bibles. Bibles that would call 
In Daniel 3.25, Jesus, a son of the gods, rather than the son of God. See if you... Oh, that was pretty. I thought it was the rapture there for a second. What was I saying? Yeah. If you've got a, if you've got a preacher... Who cannot see that there is a big difference between a son of the gods and the son of God. His eyes are blinded. His ears are dull of hearing. And he cannot understand that that's wicked. When you got a, when you got a church that can see an entire verse missing out of... 1 John chapter 5, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. When that verse is gone out of your Bible, and you read verse 6, and then verse 8, and there's no verse 7, and you can't, you can't understand that there's something not right about that, you're drunk. You're not drunk physically. You're drunk spiritually. When you've got somebody, man or woman, who, whether it's on their way to work, or during the day sometime, or whatever, watching Joyce Myers, and reading her books, and cannot discern the witchcraft that is coming out of her doctrine, the false teachings that are not in any way biblical whatsoever, that woman tells you, that if you are dying of cancer, if you speak against it, it'll just go away. I saw a clip this week of Kenneth Copeland with about four pastors on the stage. You can tell them four pastors, they were really into it, man. Kenneth Copeland, back in 2020, got rid of COVID for us all. He did. He got rid of it before I ever caught it. He did, because he taught this lesson on if you speak it, God will bring it into existence and you have enough faith in your words and you, you say the magic words and God will do it. So he got four preachers up on the stage and I mean, they were just like, blah, blah, blah. Kenneth Copeland said, I declare COVID. And the preachers are going, I declare COVID to be gone in Jesus name, to be gone in Jesus name. And never come back. And never come back. And never kill anybody. And never kill anybody. And he said, it's done. Tell Wayne Shirk that. You got people that ignorant to believe that kind of garbage. You have drunk people on your mind. You, that's what you've got, drunk people. Notice this, Leviticus 10. Do not drink wine or strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. Was God serious about this? God said, if you go into the house of God drunk, I'll kill you. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. Do you know why He said that? In Leviticus 10 here, do you know why God said that? Um... If you were boarding a plane, Gary, and the captain of the plane was standing there, you know, greeting everybody as they come on, and you smelled alcohol from his breath, would you stay on the plane? No, whether you know it or not, you're not staying on the plane. Shouldn't it be a requirement that airline pilots should not be drunk? It is. If you were having major heart surgery and your heart surgeon came in and he stumbled over the chair as he walked in, his hair was all disheveled, he hadn't shaved in three days, he'd been on a bender, and he's going to do heart surgery on you, what's your life expectancy? About an hour. You see what I'm getting at? In this case here in Leviticus 10... God told, and let me read number six with this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie it together. I'm going to close on this. In number six, we have 
the list of things that a person taking a Nazarite vow was not supposed to do. A Nazarite vow could be a, a temporary thing where you do it like for a month or 40 days or a week. In, the, in Samson's case, Samuel, John the Baptist, theirs was a lifetime Nazarite vow. Samson, we know, was a Nazarite from birth, which means he had never had a razor to his head. He was to never touch anything that defiled him that was dead. And he was to never, look at number 6, 3, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. You know what that is to us? That is a calling to each one of us that you and I ought to separate ourselves from wine and strong drink. No matter what form that comes in, whether it's in the real with the tequila or whatever, or false doctrine, separate yourself. Because you've always got some guy at the bar that says, I can handle my liquor. But can they? No. And I wouldn't trust them. But notice the issue of separation here. So back in Leviticus 10, do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee. In fact, turn to Leviticus 10. I'll, I'll just read you the reason why God did not want the priests to have a little nip before they went in to do the priesthood deal. Look at Leviticus Chapter 10, verse 9. Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. That's a colon there. That means the sentence is not finished. Why, God, can I not have a little snort before I go in and do and, and tend to the, to the service of God? Verse 10. That you may put difference between holy and unholy. So, if we were to come into church next Sunday and David had gotten with me and Matthew and Alicia and Sister Pam. And we had it worked out that next Sunday for the worship service, Sister Pam was going to lead us on the organ and we were going to play Highway to Hell. Would that be acceptable? Why not? It's unholy. It's unholy. And yet, pastor out in South Carolina did exactly that. Had his church's rock band play a cover of Highway to Hell as part of the service, because he was going to teach on hell. Do you know what we found out about that pastor? Shortly thereafter, he had to check himself into rehab for severe alcoholism. Does it make sense? You remember Oral Roberts? His son, Richard Roberts, took over the ministry after his dad died. And Richard is on, he's on YouTube, he's on camera now. And he's at a meeting that they're having. And somebody's talking about how godly Richard Roberts is. And about how he's full of the Spirit. And Richard Roberts is standing there and he just freezes. In front of everybody. Doesn't move a muscle. This goes on for 10, 15 minutes. He is either acting drunk or he literally has a spirit covering him. And finally, they just lowered him down. He passed out there on the stage and they just lowered him down. And he laid there with his hand sticking up for like an hour. And they said he's drunk with the spirit. Well, guess what happened a few months later? He got pulled over. And was given a DWI charge. 
Does it make sense? That you may put difference between holy and unholy. If God says this is right, then it's right. If God said this is wrong, then it's wrong. And if you are doing what is wrong and say that it's right, you're drunk. Spiritually. If you refuse to do what's right and think it's okay, I don't have to, you're drunk. That you may put difference between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean. And that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. So now you see the spiritual connection here. If you're a spiritual drunk, you cannot understand the Bible. You cannot understand its doctrines. You cannot understand its teachings. You do not know who God is. You do not know who Jesus Christ is. You do not know what the Word of God is or even where the Word of God is. You do not know how to put difference between what is right and what is wrong. It reminds me of that guy who was our youth, sort of our youth guy at a church I was going to out in Oklahoma when I was in Bible college. He was one of the families that worked with the teenagers in our church. And we were having a little get together at his house. And we, I went out with him to pick up the soda pop and the chips. And he's looking at a 15 year old girl walking down the street and he's lusting after her. And he says to me in the car, I believe it's okay to window shop as long as you buy at home. And God struck my heart. Man, I'm 19 years old and I know better than that. That man, listen, it would not surprise me if that guy was on some pedophile list somewhere. We've got pastors all over this country that cannot put difference between clean and unclean. The pastor out in Oklahoma who was involved in adultery with his wife and another man. And his wife arranged for the other man to shoot this pastor when he came home from his mission trip. And that's exactly what happened. How does a pastor stand behind the pulpit of God Sunday to Sunday living that kind of lifestyle and not be drunk? He is. Or he was. My hope and prayer was that while he was out on that mission trip, he got down on his face before God and repented. I'm going to ask you to bow your head this morning. I guess really if you were going to think about what this message was about, it would be about what's called self-justification. Your actions and your deeds are okay because it's you doing them. And what everybody else does is wrong and not okay because they're not me. And we have churches everywhere that are full of this kind of drunken spirit. They do not know the difference between holy and unholy. Brother Ron Dagonia preached at a church, some people that he knew in this county. He was invited to preach to fill in the pulpit. He preached. He preached against people living together in adultery. He preached against homosexuality. Preached against drinking. Things that he himself had been guilty of in the past, and I mean the adultery and the drinking. 
He preached his own sins plus other people's. After the service, they run him out of that church, told him, how dare you preach those kinds of things here? And what it was, was one of the prominent families in that church, their son was a sodomite. And that church had already decided that it was okay. They're drunk. They're drunk. And I'm asking you this morning, what is it that you're justifying before God? Things that are not right. Things that are wicked. Things that are unclean, unholy. What is it that you're... I'm not talking about your neighbor. I'm not talking about the person sitting next to you. I'm talking about you. What are you justifying as right that God says is wrong? I'm going to give you a minute to think about that. Father, I come before you today, standing here as guilty as anybody for justifying things in my own life that are just as wrong as what other people are doing. I've done that for years. And Father, I've had to come before you many times and ask forgiveness for my attitude, for the things that I'd done that I was justifying before you, things that's clearly wrong. And Father, I'm asking for your mercy on myself. I'm asking for your mercy on all of these that are here and those that are watching God, that your people would call out to you and say, God, sober me up. Give me a, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from thy presence. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would open up somebody's Red, sleepy eyes. Help them to see, God, that the wrong that they do is no better or worse than what anybody else does. And help them, dear God, to see the wrong that they do. And to see the damage that it does to other people. And the pain that it inflicts on even their own family. Just like somebody who is a drunk or just like somebody who does drugs. We do things. and We justify them by saying, well, that doesn't affect anybody but me. But it does. It's no different than the woman having an abortion saying it's my body I can do with it what I want but it's not their body it's a completely different person that they just murdered forever that person will never live in this world ever and they've taken away a life that they can never replace Father, our sins can only be justified by your mercy. 
And forgive us for trying to justify our own. Wake us up, Father. Open up our eyes. Help us to see ourselves the way you see us. Make us sober and fit for your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said,